Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wong, and thank you very much for Dr. Lazarus and Dr. Rinella for the great first talks. So it's true. Now I'm going to talk about MET-ALD. We all knew that we have those patients where the metabolic dysfunction is leading the process, then you have the patient where is uh, clearly only alcohol. But what happened with those patients that are in the middle, those ones that have, you know, dual etiology or, um, you know, where there is some um, um, overlap between both. So these are my disclosures. So today we are going to discuss, you know, the overlapping features between MASLD and ALD, try to understand a little bit on the epidemiology of MET-ALD, and then recognize the importance of distinguishing uh, MASLD from ALD. So this is from the WHO, uh, what are the risk factors for liver disease? And if you look how uh, uh, thing has been doing over the years, the main two risk factors are alcohol and obesity. And all of us that practice, you know, in a liver clinic, you can uh, tell that most of your patients are either muscle D or ALD. So uh, addressing these two issues, probably we are uh, addressing a significant portion of patients with liver disease. Alcohol consumption is very common. So 43% of the global population will consume any uh, degree of alcohol. Uh, this varies across the globe. Uh, the alcohol per capita consumption in average is 6.4 liter, or this was in 2016, but is uh, close to 10 to 12 in Europe and other regions is close to three. So there is variability across the globe. And you can say how uh, in the different regions is uh, is uh, very different. Also with the type of alcohol consumed, so this also varies across the globe. In general, the most consumed are spirits followed by beer and then wine. And it's not only the amount, it's also, you know, the pattern of alcohol consumption and you can have what we call heavy episodic drinking. And uh, this is also very frequent. Uh, you can see how in some places can be as frequent as 60% of the population having a pattern of alcohol consumption in heavy episode in drinking. And some of those patients are going to meet the criteria for an alcohol use disorder, which is actually, you know, is, uh, is the categorized the uh, psychiatric community in the DSM-5 as a specific criteria where there is lack of control and you continue drinking despite the physical, social, and family uh, consequences. And you can see how globally uh, AUV prevalence is 5.1%, but it's as high as 8.8% in some regions in Europe. And uh, correlating with all these, you can see how muscle D and alcohol are both the most important or growing uh, uh, causes for liver transplantation, uh, at least in the US, especially for male is alcohol, for females is mash, but alcohol is uh, very close to that one. So Dr. Rinella already explained you how we have uh, this uh, spectrum of esteatotic liver disease. That is what you are going to find when a patient come to your clinic with an ultrasound uh, with esteatosis, you need to define where in the spectrum is this patient and I'm going to focus in the middle, in the met ALD category. So if you look the spectrum, and this is using data from the US with the uh, uh, National Care Survey, you can see how close to 37, 38% of the population is going to have esteatotic liver disease, 32% mass LD, 2.5% met ALD, and 1% uh, ALD. This is one study. This is an other one with similar numbers. So uh, still, we are talking about a very significant proportion of uh, the population. So let's try to dig into some of the uh, questions that we have for the future in MET-ALD. Let's start with patient care. So is there any safe threshold for alcohol consumption in patients with muscle D? And the, the short answer is probably not. And this is not only coming from the population with muscle D, but if you even look in the general population, a significant amount of studies are showing that 
there is no a safety a safety threshold, especially if you are less than 60 years old. Uh, any amount of alcohol uh, is going to start producing, um, you know, a, any type of disease burden. And that's why uh, here in Canada, the recommendation for low alcohol drinking was changed uh, two years ago. And it used to be more than seven drinks per week in females and more than uh, two per day, so 14 per week for males was considered heavy drinking. Now, heavy drinking is defined as seven uh, per week, both male or females, and low alcohol or low risk is actually less than two. Uh, zero risk, obviously, zero. So uh, the, the message of this is probably the amount of alcohol is likely uh, uh, lower than what we think before. Another question, so how is light, moderate, or uh, heavy alcohol consumption is going to impact the course of the liver disease in muscle D? You know, this is a spectrum. And obviously, if you drink alcohol and you have isolated steatosis, it's not the same that if you drink alcohol, if you have cirrhosis. And we will need more data on the specific of this. But this makes sense in the context that also alcohol-related liver disease is also on a spectrum, also has a steatosis, a steatohepatitis, and then fibrosis, leading to cirrhosis and all the complications. And we need to consider that abstinence when you have liver disease, alcohol-related liver disease, is one of the most strongest predictors for outcomes. I like pretty much this figure because basically exemplify the speed of progression of the disease, if you have muscle D and you are F1, your risk, five year risk of decompensation is less than 1%. If you are alcohol, it's 2 to 15%. If you are F3, F4, and you are muscle D, it's 5 to 15%. But if you are F4 and you are ALD, you are five risk of decompensation is up to 50%. So alcohol is a driver of disease that probably is putting a significant burden there. How is the interaction? So from a pathophysiological standpoint, we know that both are going to uh, generate some uh, uh, you know, direct toxicity, either lipotoxicity or toxicity secondary to alcohol that is going to be gut liver axis dysfunction. And at the end is going to lead to more inflammatory process and apoptosis. Any specific biomarkers? And that, this is probably one of the key questions because now we are basically relying on the patient report, but do we have any biomarkers? There is nothing ready from the prime time, but you know, I think more research is needed in this field. So can we, for example, use exosomes, circulating exosomes or microRNAs or protein or lipidomics or proteomics that can help us to risk and stratify and do diagnosis in this population. What about genetic polymorphisms? That's another important one. So there is plenty of genetic polymorphisms that apply for this dual etiology because they have been shown to be uh, uh, predictive in both muscle D and ALD. And if you look, and this is a very interesting study, if you look, if you have the polymorphism, actually the highest risk of developing cirrhosis is when you combine excessive alcohol drinking and obesity. So uh, not you don't only have to have the polymorphism or one of the uh, you know injuries. If you have both, this is one of the situation where one plus one is not two and can be four or eight in this case. And then we need to have you know public health policies, as uh, Jeff was mentioning. So we can tackle this disease one patient at a time. We need to implement, uh, for example, public health policies on healthy lifestyles, on healthy uh, diet, but also restricting alcohol consumption uh, in a way that we don't have uh, the harm over the uh, population. From a uh, clinical research perspective and therapeutic trials, so one problem is the underreported of alcohol consumption. So we need to identify patients that has uh, alcohol use disorder. So one of them uh, is using the audit score. There is also a shorter uh, version, which is called the audit C, that only considers three of the questions. And the, I think this should be a screening 
for all patients with SLD because when the patient uh, comes to you, you don't know if the SLD is due to muscle LD, is met ALD, is ALD, or is any of the specific etiologies. But alcohol biomarkers, that's the other way. So if we can rely 100% on the report, can we have something else? And this is a very interesting study coming from Austria, where they did in a NAFLD clinic at that time, patient with diagnosis of NAFLD or MAFLD, and they did an alcohol biomarker in here called ethylglucoronide, and they found that these patients that were classified as NAFLD or MAFLD between 25 to 28% were actually heavy alcohol uh, consumption. So we uh, shouldn't only uh, rely on the report because usually alcohol is underreported because of the stigma or because the patient doesn't remember exactly how much he was drinking. Then, uh, so some of the therapies that are developed for muscle D can be applied for MET-ALD. Now we have uh, resmetiron approved for muscle D. Can resmetiron be used for uh, MET-ALD or other of the drugs? There is multiple uh, uh, drugs coming on the pipeline. So I think this is going to be the next step, how we can apply the knowledge that we are generating in both fields, either muscle D or, MET or ALD, in the met ALD population. So as a summary, muscle D and ALD are leading cause of chronic liver disease worldwide, and these are frequently overlap. The new definition consider those patients in the intersection or the dual etiology between muscle D and increased alcohol consumption. Usually uh, we need to identify alcohol because it's under report and maybe biomarkers is a good opportunity we should prescribe to every patient healthy diet, physical activity, as well as promotion of abstinence of minimization of alcohol intake. And then we have many questions for further research in this field from a clinical perspective, from a biomarker perspective, and then how we assess uh, the new therapies in this new entity. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to take questions.